I'm a little late to the party, but I haven't seen anyone doing what I'm trying here. So let's take a look at the new S5 2X. I think I messed up when I made my last video about the S5 II, since I could have said all of that for the X version and just called it a day. But now that's done and to keep this episode fresh, I'll try to compare the results coming out of the S5 2X to an Ari Alexa. It's a bit of a hack, but you can do it too. So stay tuned to the end of this video. For most of what I do, the S5 II and the X are almost interchangeable. The main reason I'd go with the S5 II X at this point is because it's a more of a video focused camera and some of its features are useful in projects beyond the stuff I do for the channel. It has the same awesome autofocus, which I'm using right now, sensor, battery, and card slots as the S5 II. From the outside, the main difference between the two cameras is the X is an automatic choice for anyone who hates gear that is in black. The camera is very black. I mean, all of the writing is also in black and the only thing that's not black is the record button here at the top. On the inside, the X model is capable of all of those all eye codecs that are missing on the S5 II. The data rates go high here with a cap of 800 megabits per second. But if H.265 is not your vibe, you can also record ProRes most of these options require a SSD drive connected through USB-C. Now we see some really high data rates with a maximum of 1.9 gigabits per second. And since we're in the topic of recording limitations, the camera has no recording limits except on the ProRes 422 HQ formats where it caps at 30 minute clips. But 30 minutes at the maximum data rate would create a 430 gigabytes clip. Does anyone really need that? And if that's still not enough quality, plug in an external recorder and do RAW over HDMI. An Atomos recorder will give you ProRes RAW, like the Shogun that I have here, for complete control over your footage later on. It is definitely excessive for all the YouTube stuff I do, but if I'm working on a beefier project, it's good to have the option. My main gripe with the ProRes format and all the RAW over HDMI is it cripples the 3x2 open gate sensor mode. Over HDMI, we still get 6K, but now with black bars. And ProRes only offers the more conventional 16x9, 17x9, and 4x3 formats. We want that extra height. <laughs> One challenge I found is recording to an external SSD drive takes up the USB-C port on the side of the camera, which I always use to actually power the camera. So in this situation, a dummy battery would be needed. On the anamorphic front, I saw a few reviewers talking about anamorphic stabilization on this camera, but that's pretty much in all other Lumix models at this point. Uh, we're still missing the increasingly popular 1.6 times squeeze factor here, both for preview and for stabilization. Penny, come on. Considering my work in recent years, I can confidently say this camera will replace my S1H. I'm totally fine giving up the timecode port, which I never actually used, but I'll really miss the screen articulation on the S1H. Since the X relies so much in HDMI and USB-C connections, it would be short-sighted to ignore the simplistic screen articulation. On the plus side, the reduced weight, reliable autofocus for video, and the faster open gate modes are all big wins for the S5 II X. After filming a ton with the S5 II while waiting for the new model, I feel the S5 II was more of a disruptive introduction to the market while the S5 II X only builds on that for a more specific audience. The price difference of 200 bucks between them is negligible considering the amount of additional video options offered by the X. If you were to unlock the same thing on the S5 II, you'll need the paid upgrade and that itself costs 200 bucks. For me, I'm actually switching the X for my main camera and keeping the S5 II as B cam. Now, let's see about that whole Ari Alexa comparison, right? The S5 IIX, like its barely older sibling, has a feature called real-time LUT. You might be thinking, baking a LUT onto my files is so 2010, when Technicolor made the cine-style profile for Canon cameras. Looking from that angle, indeed, lame. But that's not what I'm proposing here. To start, 
I'm going to create a color space transform in Resolve that takes Panasonic's Vlog and Vgamut and converts that to RE Log C and Log C3. Then export that as a 33 point dot cubelet that will load onto the S52X. If you need a tutorial on that, Lumix has a great one that I linked in the description. This came out less scientific than I wanted, but I was producing a short and our ACAM was an Alexa Mini. For BTS, I used the S52X with the real-time LUT and tried to get some shots that cut well with ACAM. The main struggle was each camera was on very different settings for ISO and ND, which meant I had to balance exposure before applying Resolve's Log C to 709 LUT. After adjusting the exposure, they did match pretty well and could easily be cut together and graded similarly. If you like what you see, you can download my conversion LUT from the description as well. I'm pretty sure Panasonic and Ari would not approve of my creativity here, but do you? Besides that, what are your thoughts on the upgrade? Have you been holding out for autofocus and all I? Are you, like me, replacing your S1H with the S52X? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Chitta out.